Lesz, aki, akinek a, a jó és a rossz közgazdaságtalan Economics of Good and Evil című könyvének az apropaján fogunk ma este beszélgetni. És a beszélgető partnerünk lesz még Uraközi Balázs, aki a Tudományos Akadémia Közgazdaságtalan Intézetének a kutatója. A beszélgetés angolul fog zajlani, úgyhogy aki, aki kényelmesebben érzi magát, hogy a magyarul hallgatja, az, az talál fejehallgatókat a bejárat mellett, a, de mielőtt elkezdjük, megkérem Szűs Tamást, aki a, a, az Európai Bizottság képviseletének a vezetője, hogy egy pár szóban nyissa meg az eseményt. Köszönöm szépen, tényleg csak pár szót mondani. Először is szeretettel és tisztelettel üdvözlöm valamennyi vendégünket. Külön nagykövet asszony, Csehország nagykövetét, aki megtisztelte a rendezvényt jelenlétével, és természetesen a főszereplő Tomás Sedlacseket. Nem gondolt egyikünk sem, hogy éppen Tamás napon kell egyébként sorára rendezvény lett, mind a ketten Tamások vagyunk, úgyhogy ez egy külön ünnepi alkalom ebből a szempontból. Nagyon örülök, hogy itt az Európa pontban megint állt házban, szerencsére mostanára már szokásossá vált, és azt gondolom, hogy egy nagyon izgalmas vita elé nézünk, nagyon fontos téma eredeti feldolgozásban, Elég sok komoly és súlyos témával foglalkozik manapság mind a magyar, mind a nemzetközi média az európai integrációval kapcsolatban. Éppen ma jöttek ki az újabb bizottsági vélemények, ajánlások Magyarországgal kapcsolatban. Szerintem nagyon jó, hogy egy olyan témával tudunk most foglalkozni, aminek ehhez semmi köze nincsen, viszont szóval nagyon érdek feszítő, és egy eredeti előadók tudok meghallgatni, aki nem csak nálunk, hanem a Jél Egyetemen, a Károly Egyetemen, Hávereg elnök tanácsadójaként működött, tehát azt hiszem, hogy minden szempontból egy érdekes estének nézünk elébe. Köszönöm szépen! So uh, let me change to English and and I'll ask Tomas to to start with a short presentation about his approach and his his book that we talk about tonight. Um, Tomas, I mean I mean the the head of the representation, Tomas, uh, uh, already listed some of the titles that Tomas, the author Tomas, uh, has. So I, I won't go into details uh, in in his CV, but uh, yeah, he he's a former advisor to to President Havel, and he's a, a chief strategist uh, of the CSOB, a, a major Czech bank. Uh, he's also a, uh, a Yale fellow and a member of the uh, Czech uh, National Advisory Committee or Council, uh, and. Many more, I'm sure, but that's probably enough. So he started a short presentation, and we'll have a discussion after that. And there will be opportunity for questions uh, at the end of the discussion. So be patient until then. So thank you very much for having me here tonight. And let's. Uh, I want to do maybe 15, 20 minutes as an introduction, and then I'll be very happy to you know, dive into a debate of. of, of uh, what's happening today or whatever interests you. Uh, okay, well, let's start with what I think is uh, wrong, is there's a wrong diagnosis of what's happening. What you hear in the media all the time that the economy is depressed and that's the problem. Uh, I think this is a wrong diagnosis. We're not depressed, we are manic depressed. And there's a huge <laughs> difference between uh, the two. Um, uh, you know, if a, if a depressed patient is getting his mood back, this is good news. If a manic depressive patient is getting his or her mood back, this is not in itself good news because you might revert back into, into the mania. Economics has a tendency to overdo its happy moods into uh, manias. In fact, if you read the description or definition of mania, you have overly optimistic expectations of the current and future situation. You think everything's going to be better and better and better. You spend much more money this is very typical of, of many people. They just spend ridiculous amounts of money over things that they don't need or they feel they need. And the fourth, also very important thing, is that 
in these manic periods, these people who suffer from bipolar disorder are very creative and very efficient. And this is our problem. Uh, so, you know, if you look on Greece, let's say, okay, that's a depressed economy. If I simplify this, if Greek people were double as much as they do, they wouldn't have a problem. Okay, let's take this simplified reading that we get from the newspaper all the time and let's apply it to Ireland. There, it's a typical manic uh, problem. If the Irish, especially bankers, work half the time, then they work, they wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> and this is also true of United, of United States. So curing just the depression with antidepressives, which is the only thing that we can do, is harmful if you keep feeding the patient antidepressives during, the, during his manic periods. Uh, well, let's, uh, let, because I have a flip chart, so I will flip it <laughs> and I will chart it. Um, let's actually try to take a longer view and let's have a look on the very first business cycle in the history of mankind. Now we are suffering the, the most recent one and we should always look on the things from the, from the perspective of the whole cycle. Now, who can recall the oldest business cycle ever in the written history of mankind? It's a story that you all know. Nile? Okay, that's very close. So maybe you can remember it. So it has to do something with Egypt. Joseph. Joseph, yes. Joseph and the amazing multicolor <laughs> dream coat. Jo okay, so the story, you know this, this is Genesis 41. This is Bible. You don't expect macroeconomic um, you know, debates in the Bible, but yet it's full of them. And it's just a matter of connecting the two, which I think few people do. Okay, so the story, as you know, of course, from your childhood, Pharaoh has a dream about seven fat cows. You know, I always have to be careful not to look on anybody. Seven, seven, seven fat cows and seven lean cows. And he doesn't know what, what to make of it. So he calls Joseph. Now Joseph is a prophet. And Joseph says, congratulations, Pharaoh. You just had the first macroeconomic prediction 14 years um, ahead of time. Here you would have grain. Today we would do GDP. And this is simply time. So, it's quite simple, and uh, Pharaoh says, thank you very much, now give me a macroeconomic advice what to do with the business cycle, because these things have been happening from time immemorial. And Joseph says, because Joseph is a good student of Keynes, so uh, Joseph gives him a Keynesian advice, and he says, in the good years, do not eat everything that grows. In other words, decrease your consumption, Save, oh, this is, a, this is a strange word. When I lecture this to Americans, I always say, look it up in Wikipedia. Uh, there, uh, there used to be a time before you actually bought something, you went through this purgatory of decreased consumption because you wanted to buy a car or a laptop. So for some time, you couldn't go to movies. You remember when we were young, we used to do that too. And then, Take the energy that you have stored and invest it. Now, this word we already know very well, so there's no need to explain it. In other words, work with time energy, take it from here and put it here so that you decrease the amplitude of a business cycle. And of course, this is what they did, and the story is sort of a happy end for Egypt, not a very happy end to, for, for everybody else. Now, uh, first, there are many lessons that you can draw from this, but I only want to take the most important. It is not the role of economists to increase GDP. This is what we think today. In fact, if you actually follow this closely, the role of an economist is to decrease GDP. Uh, and then uh, increase it here. And now, let's fast forward some 3,000 or 4,000 years Today, we, America alone produces about 70,000 economists who get trained in economics for three or more years. Um, and we do this you know, five hours or eight hours a day, only to come up with, we also had seven very good years. Those were bracketed by two very important events. One was September 11, and the other one was uh, September 15. This is, of course, the Twin Tower attack, and this is the collapse of Lehman Brothers. This is, of course, 
a pure coincidence, it's just that it exactly works out to seven years, during which our civilization, I mean the Western civilization, including the rest of the world, had very strong period of growth. What did we do? We did this. Largely. Why? Because we thought it's going to go like this forever, so this is actually possible. If you remember, Alan Greenspan was once credited for inventing a non-cyclical economy. We thought that this rhythm that has been here with us for thousands and thousands of years literally is over, and we now know, because we're very clever, because we know how to compute, compute things that nobody understands, uh, including the economists. Um, so, so we basically we're doing this. So it's you know our our uh, macroeconomic policy cannot be properly called Keynesian. Our macroeconomic policy is left of Keynes. Keynes would be from today's perspective a right winger, almost an extreme right winger, because he would be telling here to us to run budget surpluses, not budget deficits. And people would scream at him for, for you're slowing down the economy. This is this is extremely conservative. This is extremely cruel. So I call it bastard Keynesianism. This is what we are doing today. We took half of the sentence, it's okay to run deficits, and we forgot the uh, other, if you run surpluses in the good times. So we only took half of it, we married it with populism, and what we got is a wonderful, much more simpler, run deficits all the time. This debate, I think, is over. Uh, the Keynesian debate, which we had, of course, you can here see that Keynes didn't do anything else except for applying this Joseph story uh, in a little bit more technical, technical manner. Um, the debate whether we should stimulate the economy by deficits, which has been over and, you know, with us for the last 80 or 90 years, is over. Why? Because we simply have run out of that drug. Deficit you can look at as a drug that increases your, your energy. Uh, now there is no more of that drug left. It ran out in this country, it ran out in, 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 uh, in, in Greece, it ran out in, in Ireland. It is running out even in the United States of America and even in Germany. The most stable countries, they can no longer feed the economy with, with deficits. Even they are being threatened by actually uh, decreases of rating and we are all realize we only have a couple of more years with antidepressants, and then we need to get rid of the antidepressants. The way it works is, so this is sort of fiscal policy. You know that the government, we have two hands with which we can sort of influence, not direct, but influence the economy. The, the one is monetary policy, and the other one is fiscal policy. So this is an example of fiscal policy, but you can tell the same story in monetary policy. For those of you who are not economists. Um, well, in fact, I should, I should correct myself. You know, Milton Friedman once said, we are all Keynesians now. Uh, I would, if I may, add to uh, Milton Friedman, and today I would say, nobody's an economist anymore. So, uh, monetary policy, this is very simplified, but it serves the purpose, is the monopoly of printing money. Extremely simplified, but at the end of the day, it works. Fiscal policy is a monopoly of printing debt. Basically, that's sort of all there is to it. Uh, both of these things are extremely powerful and very tempting. And they even have the tendency uh, to look very, say, as if they create freedom and possibilities in the beginning. But at the end of the day, they enslave. Uh, this is also interesting to notice because in Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, as you know, uh, uh, the word debt and the word sin are, are synonyms. Uh, so the Lord's Prayer uh, in Matthew 14 should be literally translated, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. <laughs> And uh, this is also true in German, this is also true in Latin. For those of you who, who, who go to masses, you remember, Demini nos debita nostra, forgive us our debits, forgive us our, our debits cards. 
Um, <laughs> so this is actually the prayer of many Wall Street bankers, you know, forgive us our debts as we don't forgive those who are indebted to us. Um, both of these things behave similarly like uh, the, Lord of, the Ring of Power from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Who is, the trilogy is called The Lord of the Ring, or The Lord of the Rings. Who is The Lord of the Rings? Who is the CEO of the ring? Well, Sauron isn't really. He's looking for it. He doesn't own it. The ownership is disjointed. He wants to control it, but he can't. This is the whole plot. Who controls the ring? The ring itself, exactly. The ring is what in psychoanalysis is called object petit a. It is something that was created to serve, blah, blah, blah. It ends up mastering you. Like, uh, for example, the robots in, in Matrix. We created the robots to serve us, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, we are slaves of the robots. And you see this in many, many archetypes, warning us that um, this is a propensity of certain things that look servant-like in the beginning, but then they rebel, they get a life of their own, and the, and the ring has a will of its own. This is why none of the wise ever touch the ring. So, uh, let's start with Gandalf, never touched the ring, never even close to it. Uh, Aragorn, uh, Galadriel, even, even, uh, even Elrond, never touched the ring. These are, of course, mythical figures with very strong willpower, but they were afraid to touch the ring. Why? Because they knew that it's so tempting, you can do anything with it, that it ends up um, enslaving you. So, the Council of Elrond decided that the ring must be destroyed. This is what we did with monetary policy. We took it out from politics. We took it, I would even go as far as to say, we took it out of democracy, and we gave it to national banks. That was the first step. And the second step is uh, European National Bank, where there is no influence of, um, of, of politicians whatsoever. So politicians can no longer use this power um, to solve whatever problems they have. That's why we don't have a problem with inflation. That's why um, we don't have problems with devaluation and trade wars. Now the question as we speak is what should we do with fiscal policy? Should we also destroy it? and give it to, I don't know, European body or independent body, or should we put in our constitution that we, don't, we no longer will use this? Whatever the solution is, uh, the attempt is either we, we bang both of these hands because they end up enslaving you. We, I mean, if you, if you, if you read the newspapers, today's newspapers, and you substitute these two words, you really end up with the gospel. You know, the Greeks were falling under the weight of their debt or sin. They no longer could carry the weight of their own debts, sins, and they needed a